Okay, so today is going to be um, a transition, as I said last week, to something slightly different than we've been having for the past couple weeks. Um, reset the slideshow. Um, the past couple weeks we've been studying kind of general theory about what is history, how medieval history has kind of existed and kind of been constructed and how that ties into broader ideas about race and racism. Um, today, we are going to switch into looking at specific moments uh, of medieval history that are kind of very popular today um, in, in kind of current culture. Um, and that means actually having to give lectures on medieval events, which is not something I've done so far. So this is a little bit of a bait and switch, um, but you should have fun with it, um, I hope. Um, and also kind of your readings for section will be different than you've kind of encountered. These are medieval primary sources that you have in, um, for reading this week. There is no kind of historical fiction. So the kind of types of analysis I want you to bring to them are going to be slightly different. The questions I will ask are going to be different. I'm going to be interpreting um, and trying to figure out what, why these sources exist and what we're going to try to set, what they're trying to say and what we can use them for. Um, but, you know, it is kind of inevitable that we would have had to do um, something like this eventually. So with that in mind, um, this is usually the part in the lecture where I would ask you what you know about Crusades, right? They've touched, we've touched on them a little bit. They're kind of background to Ivanhoe. Um, actually, while I was kind of preparing this lecture, I found this cover for Crusader Kings 2 video game. Um, the shield, Desjadado, right? This is a picture of Ivanhoe, um, even though they don't claim it. I thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, so this would be usually when I would be asking you to tell me what you know about Crusading and Crusades, of course, you know, pandemic, so no. Um, so usually the responses would be things like Holy War, you know, Muslims versus Christians, East versus West, Knights Templar, those sorts of things. And a lot of what you think about Crusades is probably true. Um, some are modern memories and some are kind of both. Um, Crusades today usually stand as the start um, of a European expansion, right? The expansion of Europe. I actually have a... Cambridge History of Medieval Warfare here, and it just starts the, the chapter. It starts expanding Europe, the Crusades, right? So Crusades are, are often seen as like the first colonial endeavor, as it were, for, the, for Europe. Um, they also stand at something I've talked about before, that is the beginning of a persecuting society. The... Um, particularly the, the, the anti-Jewish riots that occur, the pogroms um, around the First Crusade, are often seen as um, the beginnings of modern uh, genealogies of persecution. Um, okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's go do some history of the more traditional variety. Um, and as a warning, this is going to be a narrative from a European point of view. Um, more recently, a lot of scholarship has been working on this, this same quarter story from kind of an Islamic point of view. Um, I don't know that one very well. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. Um, so kind of the background I want to give is kind of a story of Islam and Rome. Um, because after the fourth century, right, way back when, um, the, power, the power center of the Roman Empire had shifted from Rome to Constantinople. Constantinople, kind of at the gates of the Black Sea, um, between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, between Greece and Anatolia, and between East and West in a lot of ways, um, from the European point of view, was a much better strategic uh, location for, um, for so many reasons. Um, and so while the Western Empire kind of struggles and collapses under what has been called barbarian invasions. And so you have the Franks and the, Burgundi, uh, Bur the Burgundians and the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and all those kind of tribes that we've talked about kind of that don't 
quite really exist, but maybe kind of existed. Um, the East still remains very, very powerful. And in fact, this map here um, that's kind of marking out the kingdom of the Ostrogoths is a little bit misleading. Uh, the Byzantine Empire controls most of the southern part of the Italian peninsula um, and also kind of wields power in Rome through something called the Exarchate of Ravenna. Ravenna is kind of on the other side of Italy from Rome, on just kind of you know, just across the peninsula. Um, and the Exarch, who is the, the, the emperor's kind of stand-in after the fall of the Western Empire there, um, is incredibly powerful and influences you know, sometimes he actually kidnaps the Pope and takes him to uh, Constantinople to, to kind of be tried for things. Um, that happens once or twice in the 7th and 8th century. Um, so, the, the, you know, even though the Western Empire is not under, does not have an emperor anymore, um, the Eastern Empire still kind of re retains a great deal of power and influence over its politics. Um, and the Empire, Roman Empire had been through slumps before. The third century particularly was a terrible time to be in the Roman Empire between civil war, famine, and plague. Um, but even with this kind of reduced state, um, and actually this, the more I look at it, this map on the right is terrible, um, because the uh, Empire still held its breadbasket in Egypt and all of the kind of profitable provinces of North Africa. And Egypt is particularly important because it is the source of something called the Annonia, which just means yearly. Um, but what it, was, what it was was most of the grain for the capital cities of Constantinople and Rome were purchased and subsidized by the emperor um, and brought in yearly shipments on grain ships um, to feed the populations of those cities. Um, and these are incredibly important for a bunch of reasons, which I'll get into in a second. Um, and so kind of after kind of the fifth century kind of was terrible and um, the Eastern Empire lost control of the West for a while, uh, with the reign of this guy, Emperor Justinian, um, who ruled from 527 to 565, the Roman Empire looked like it was about to come back. Um, Justinian had launched several wars in Italy and was winning, more or less, against the Ostrogoths and kind of the, the people who had kind of conquered the Western Empire. Um, and it looked, it's quite possible that if everything had kind of continued as it was, that the Western Empire would just, the, or at least the Italian peninsula, would have come back under the control of the East um, by the end of Justinian's reign. However, uh, in a very kind of topical moment, approximately, in approximately 540, um, and really from 541 to 549, the Mediterranean basin was hit by a massive pandemic. Um, this is what's usually called the first pandemic because it's the first wide-scale outbreak that we know of of a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. And Yersinia pestis is usually what we call, if Yersinia pestis gets into your bloodstream, we call it bubonic plague. If Yersinia pestis gets into your lungs, we call it pneumonic plague. Um, Bubonic plague tends to have untreated a 50 to 70% fatality rate, Pneumonic plague, if untreated, has a 95% fatality rate. Um, so as much of this kind of pandemic kind of hitting Justinian um, and his empire killed as much as 60% of Europe, Europe's population um, until kind of the shocks and aftershocks for the next about 200 years kind of faded out. Um, so this had a massive demographic impact immediately. Um, unfortunately, just as Justinian had just spent a lot of money on troops in Italy, um, and therefore was kind of the empire itself was kind of in a weakened position and unable to muster the same sort of resources it might in a time of stability and peace. And that basically ended um, any hopes for the uh, Roman Empire reclaiming the West. Um, 
they also left because the the plague doesn't just go away as we're finding out you know it mutates and you get new varieties um the empire was thus vastly weakened and unable to resist Islamic expansionism in the 7th century, right? The Prophet Muhammad dies in uh, 632, um, having kind of established uh, territorial control over most of the Arabian Peninsula. His successors over the next 100 years conquer the entirety of North Africa, well into Persia, and most of the Iberian Peninsula, that is to say what is now modern Spain and Portugal, as you can see on the map behind me. Um, and our, you know, theoretically kind of, we've already talked about the Battle of Tour or Poitiers, um, which is that kind of, did it happen, didn't it happen, um, of Charlemagne or Charlemagne's father stopping the, uh, grandfather stopping the Franks, stopping the Muslims in, from, from conquering the rest of Christendom, right, as the kind of high watermark, um, and so the Byzantine Empire, of course, is now left um, with really just kind of the Balkans uh, and Anatolia, the, the what is now modern Turkey. Um, I mean, and the Arab conquest here is kind of top level only in the same way that like the barbarian, barbarian tribes had kind of conquered the ruling class of say what is now uh, Francia and uh, Italy. Um, you know, there's there's no kind of deep um, Arabization of the population that occurred slowly over time. Um, but so the most important kind of lasting impact uh, the Arab conquest of the Mediterranean or the Southern Mediterranean had was it deprived the Byzantine Empire of Egypt, right? And this had two massive effects, or one massive effect with two kind of impacts. Um, because conquest of Egypt means that the those grain shipments, the yearly grain shipments from from uh, Egypt to Constantinople, ceased. They stopped to stopped existing, which means Constantinople suddenly had a hard time feeding its population, which means its population scattered. The second problem with that is that the empire itself did not own thousands of grain ships to carry the Annona from Egypt to Constantinople. They rented them and in at very good prices. So the Anona shipments, the yearly shipments of grain to Egypt sort of subsidized, as it were, the trading fleet in the Mediterranean. And without those funds, all of a sudden it became a lot harder for um, to be profit to have to make a profit. Um, while shipping things across the Mediterranean, which was very, very dangerous in general. Um, and so Mediterranean trade and the number of people just simply sailing the Mediterranean um, reduced almost overnight from this. Um, and this puts the West and into a deep economic depression um, from the Arab invasions to the 13th century. Um, there is no gold coinage minted in the West um, so, so silver economy only, kind of gold. You need a lot of resources around to have to, to make a gold co coin worth having. Um, silver kind of as a site of an economic depression. Um, of course, the Arab world being incredibly prosperous and uh, powerful in this time is kind of the cultural height of uh, cities like Baghdad um, and Cordoba in, in Spain. Um, and Byzantine Empire kind of stuck somewhere in between. Um, Byzantine coins still made, are made in gold. The Byzant, right, is a is a golden coin with from the Byzantine Empire, is incredibly considered incredibly valuable in Europe during this period of time. And of course, as I've talked about before, Western kind of in this later period, the West starts to see an economic revitalization on the sale of slaves. A sale of Western citizens, uh, citizens, West people, uh, Western Europeans as slaves to the Arab world, um, in exchange for that gold, which they then melt down into and traded into silver, um, and this kind of gives us a rough state of affairs until the 11th century, when events start to kind of shake things up. 
the first kind of event that shakes things up um, is that the quote-unquote mad caliph, um, al-Hakim uh, Biamir Allah, destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Sepulchre, which is a church built over the site of Jesus's execution and tomb, spot of execution and tomb. Um, it's also uh, a site very important. This is a site very important to uh, the Prophet Muhammad's uh, stay in Jerusalem. Um, and the again, Al Hakim destroyed the ordered the Church of the Holy Sepulchre destroyed in one, the year one thousand and nine. Um, there is this event has impact in the West. Um, the Pope at the time, Sergius the Fourth, writes a letter calling to cleanse um, the Holy Land of Muslims. Um, nothing happens, and the church is rebuilt by uh, 1050. So within 40 years, the church is completely rebuilt. Everything is kind of back to normal. Some people have talked, uh, older scholarship has talked about a fear of the year 1000, that the one, year 1000 would mark the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the world. Um, there's really no evidence for this in our sources. Um, another event which had kind of an impact here is something called the Great Schism of 1054. This is the final kind of ultimate division between the what we call the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, um, which is a weird thing because Catholic is just the Latin word for Orthodox, but whatever. Um, so they're both called themselves the Orthodox Church. Um, but this is kind of the division, we, what we would now call the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church from Western Roman churches. So the now the uh, kind of the Byzantine Empire, uh, cats knocking things over, um, the Byzantine Empire and the um, uh, the Western, kind of the entire West, have kind of different religious affiliations from this point onwards. Um, and kind of above all else in these if a series of events that kind of prepare us for crusade, um, we have something called, that have been called in retrospect, the Gregorian Reforms, which take their um, name after a guy named Hildebrandt of Savona, uh, who is better known as Pope Gregory VII, who ruled as Pope from 1073 to 1085. These reforms um, did not start with Gregory. He was simply kind of the most vocal um, exponent of them. We have a picture of Gregory. Here is a picture of Gregory being uh, pecked by the Holy Spirit. Um, Gregory, uh, as I said, he do, he's, he's not responsible. He didn't start them. Um, he simply kind of put them into practice um, or, you know, had the most controversy around him, really. Um, but the Gregorian reforms are things like priests need to stop being married and can't have concubines anymore. Uh, which is something people didn't quite recognize is that priests could get married until about um, 1100 in the Catholic Church. Um, there's also something kind of uh, uh, tied into this called the Peace of God movements. These are kind of popular religious movements um, in various parts of Western Europe aimed at restricting what we might call feudal violence, that is to say kind of your local lord raiding you, um, following kind of the the collapse of Carolingian power, collapse of, kind of the, the, as the Holy Roman Empire kind of had a little bit of difficulty holding on to pieces, um, you saw more and more local scale violence, or maybe you didn't. It's a, that's a whole kind of historical question. Um, and the third thing that really kind of was the main focus of these Gregorian reforms was something called simony. Uh, simony takes its name from Simon Magus in the Acts of the Apostles, who offers Paul, St. Paul, money in exchange for um, the same powers that he that Paul gets from Jesus, the same kind of uh, powers of blessing and mir making miracles. Um, and so simony refers to the, it doesn't end well for Simon Magus, um, as you might expect, simony refers to the sale of church offices. Um, that is to say, give me 5,000, you know, Byzants, and I will make you Bishop of Trier, right? 
Um, and this is very, very important. Not simply because like it was a lot of the ways in which um, you know various princes and rulers made money, uh, but also because the process of appointing bishops specifically was vital to the perpetuation of power within the Holy Roman Empire. And in one of the in his kind of in, in the attacks on simony, one of the things that the popes start to assert, and Gregory the Seventh among all of them asserts the most, is that the appointing of bishops is the Pope's job alone. Um, and this might seem strange because of course it is, right? The Pope is the head of the Catholic Church. Um, but the Pope, I mean, as the Pope was always acknowledged as the head of the Catholic Church, but until a, the Gregorian reforms, it was much more of a honorary position. Um, local rulers kind of oversaw local church affairs and appointed bishops. Um, and following Charlemagne, rulers found that appointing bishops was very, very useful because bishops at least couldn't marry and didn't have children and couldn't therefore uh, give their children any lands that they had. And so appointing bishops was a great way to get yourself an administrator for a set of territories that would not challenge your right to rule that territory. Um, and kind of until the 10th century, the papacy was in a terrible state. It's basically a plaything um, of the Roman aristocracy. With uh, They weren't very religious. They were just kind of stabbing each other and murdering each other in the back. There's one year in the 10th century where there are five different, four different popes um, because they're just sequentially murdered. Um, and kind of into this, you know, so the popes kind of coming into this was carnal, corrupt, uninspiring. So they didn't really have that much power. Um, and in fact, it's the Holy Roman Empire uh, under the reign of Emperor Otto that intervenes to try to reform this kind of festering mass in Rome. Um, but this, as you kind of said, quite quickly backfires on him. Because um, radicals kind of invigorated by this idea that we should reform and make a good church here on earth, um, start asserting that the emperor is subservient to the pope. Um, and that the pope, again, has the right to appoint all these bishops and the emperor can't do anything about it. And this is the start of what has been called either the investiture contest or the investiture controversy, which is to say it's a fight over whether or not the Holy Roman Empire or the Holy Roman Emperor could invest bishops, which is to say grant them the symbols of their office. Um, bishops are given a ring and a staff, usually. Um, this is a very technical point. Um, it's huge, like, not really that important in the grand scheme of things, except for the fact that it is hugely important. Because who invests a bishop controls who gets paid, right, for for that bishop uh, getting their office, and also kind of was the basis of the administration system for the Holy Roman Empire. And so kind of this attempt at papal supremacy to fight simony um, and fight simony or to, to take control of simony for the office of the pope um, leads to 50 years of civil war in Germany from 1076, which is the year after Gregory takes office, to 1122, when it kind of resolves with something that is called the Concordat of Worms, which is a great title for things. Um, and from this, you get things like the factions of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines in Italy, if you've ever heard those terms. The Guelphs, um, you can remember which is which. The Guelph, Guelph is short, and therefore Pope is short, and the Guelphs are the Pope's faction. Ghibelline is long and complicated. Holy Roman Empire is long and complicated. Holy, the Ghibellines are the uh, imperial faction. Um, and in this period, in these this 50-year period, um, we have lots of anti-popes and anti-emperors. Um, Anti-pope, if you combine it with a pope, if you touch a pope and an anti-pope together, they don't explode. Uh, an anti-pope is what is is kind of a, a retrospective title for someone who fails, who, who is claiming the papal throne, but fails to obtain it. 
Um, so there's a challenge, you know, you're, so Gregory is the Pope. Um, and he says, Holy Roman Emperor, uh, at this point, Henry IV, um, you can no longer invest bishops. And Henry goes, that's bullshit. You can't be the legitimate Pope. This guy instead is the legitimate Pope. That guy is the anti-Pope, right? Um, and this kind of events, the, 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 this, this investiture conscious is often cited actually as the reason why Germany um, was unable to unify as a state in the Middle Ages, unlike France, England, and Spain. Right? because the popes kind of effectively hamstrung the administrative system that was bringing, the, bringing it together. Um, whether or not we believe that, that's a whole other thing. Um, kind of the important bit of this is that the papacy kind of initially seems to win. Uh, Gregory, uh, the, the, Henry IV kind of abases himself before... Gregory, but then manages to, to turn things around, um, and Gregory the Seventh dies in exile from Rome. Um, but kind of at the end, that the Concordat of Worms, it is the popes who actually end up winning here. Um, so what does this have to do with Crusades, right? Maybe the conquest of the Arab world, but what does Gregory have to do with Crusades? Well, Gregory's successor is this guy who's standing on the box, his name, and also riding the horse. His name is Urban II, who ruled from 1088 to 1099. Uh, Greg, Urban II is very much a kind of in the papal supremacist camp. He was made a cardinal by Gregory VII in 1075. That's the year Gregory took office. Um, but at the time when Urban is made Pope, it's actually unclear who the Pope is and who the anti-Pope is. That is to say, the imperial faction is winning. Urban himself, despite his name, cannot enter the city of Rome um, and is basically wandering around France looking for allies to help him out. And while doing so, while kind of wandering around France looking for help, um, Urban receives an ambassador from the Byzantine Emperor, Alexios I uh, Komenos. Um, the Komenoi are the kind of ruling dynasty for the next 150 years, 200 years um, for the Byzantine Emperor. Um, to help, so he receives an ambassador who says, we need soldiers to help us fight the Seljuk Turks, who are um, kind of in Anatolia. And this is basically a request for mercenaries to come and help. Um, the Byzantine Emperor has a long and storied tradition of hiring barbarians to come and fight his battles for him. Um, and it's a bit desperate because, again, there's a schism going on since 1054, right? The different religious systems, not great. Um, so, the, you know, the Byzantine Emperor, Empire is not in a great state right now. Um, and thus makes this request to the Pope for help. Um, and in response to this request for help, or after, well, after this request for help, after having received this request for help, Urban II gives a speech at Clermont in France in 1095, uh, which, in which he says something, and which is received by cries of Deus Volt, which is Latin for God wills it, and the First Crusade is launched. And the First Crusade, as we will see, taps into the religious fervor that kind of was generated by this reforming movement in the 11th century, the Gregorian reforms, um, and it seems to provide a solution to those objections to lay violence, which is to say, you can't kill people in Europe, but go kill people somewhere else. But I have been deliberately ambiguous about what Urban said. As you will see in your readings for this week, there are at least five versions of Urban's speech at Claremont, none of which really agree with any of the others in a lot of ways. Um, and all of which were written after the success of the First Crusade. They're written in retrospect. They know what they've accomplished, and they went back and put words into a post mouth. To, to kind of get it. Um, because kind of what we know, the actual course of the Crusades doesn't make much sense, right? The Byzantine ambassador is looking for mercenaries to fight in Anatolia. There's no mention of Jerusalem. The church of the Holy Sepulchre, Sepulchre sure, was destroyed, 
Um, and the Pope at the time called for a war against Muslims, but that was a hundred years ago and the church has been rebuilt for 50 years. Um, the Christianity at this point does not have a strong concept of holy war. St. Augustine, who was writing in the 4th and 5th centuries, um, has said that the, church can stay, say, that the church can sanction state violence, imperial violence, with an emperor working with the church, violence can be legitimate. But there's no articulation of just warfare or holy warfare really formally until the theology of Thomas Aquinas in the 13th and late 13th century, so 200 years after the crusade. That is to say, crusades did not develop the idea of holy war, sorry, the, the act of going on crusades developed the idea of holy war. The act, the idea of holy war did not cause the crusades, right? Um, and therefore, when you do your reading this week, you should really ask yourself, what did Urban think he was doing? Um, and relatedly, what did the crusaders think they were doing? And why did they think that that was their goal? Whatever Urban said, um, the idea of crusading took off like wildfire. Um, we can see this in something that is called the People's Crusade, um, which is a quote-unquote popular movement. It's basically just everyone, kind of lower class, unorganized, it's unclear who these people were, movement led, led by a guy called Peter the Hermit, um, kind of all just migrate across Europe um, and wind up in Constantinople and the emperor is like, we asked for soldiers, who are these farmers? What's going on? Um, he goes, well, okay, uh, go over there and the Turks are over there. And so they step outside of the city and are instantly annihilated um, by a Turkish army, the People's Crusade. Um, Peter the Hermit himself manages to escape, uh, shockingly, um, back to the main crusade. Um, the People's Crusade is also kind of the one that's been associated with the anti-Jewish violence in the Rhineland. Again, this is one of your readings. You'll read a kind of a Jewish account of that violence. Um, and then there is the, what is kind of the actual crusade, which is sometimes called the Princess Crusade because it actually has uh, leaders. Um, this is mostly French. Uh, French knights, um, French knights and nobles, or what is now f nobles from what is now France and um, what is now France. Uh, England um, is actually are also currently kind of going through a similar thing to the investiture controversy, though it's not as nearly as kind of complicated. And of course, Germany, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, doesn't like the Pope very much right now, so they don't send people. Um, they don't even think he's the legitimate Pope. Um, and so there are widely varying reports as to the size of both the people and the Prince's Crusade, um, somewhere between 10,000 and 150,000. Who knows? Um, there's no kind of way to get accurate numbers out of uh, medieval sources, I think. Um, the Crusade itself is led by a man named Raymond the Sixth, the Fourth of Toulouse, the Count of Toulouse. Um, which is why the county of Toulouse is so prominent on the map behind you, um, and the bishop Adelmar uh, de la Puy. Um, and these are both men from Occitania, which is to say what is now the south of France, the place where they say where they speak Occitan, um, which is to say the, lang the place where they say Oc instead of the north, which says Oi, which is what we now call We. Um, and the members of the crusade, unlike stories you may have heard, were not second sons seeking their fortune. Because crusading, because moving, picking up and moving halfway across the known world was expensive. Um, it's also not even kind of lords looking to expand their territories. This is not an expansion of Europe. This is a relocation. Raymond's departure, Raymond, Count Raymond's departure, meant that his county was taken over by a rival. Um, his son, Alphonse Jordan, was born after he left on crusade, and thus William IX of Aquitaine, Count William of Aquitaine, conquers the county of Toulouse for his wife, Philippa, 
who Raymond had kind of disinherited. Philippa was actually the rightful heir to the county of Toulouse. Raymond is her uncle. He just took it because he was the guy and he was in charge. Um, and that's this itself, this, this, this conflict between William the um, Ninth and Alphonse Jordan, um, really between William the Ninth and Raymond the Fourth, starts a war that lasts pretty much 200 years um, and it eventually results in the county of Toulouse being conquered by the kings of France. Um, this is also the subject of my dissertation, in case you wondered why that aside was there. In any case, right, economic and kind of political reasons for the conquest are kind of right out. They, they don't really make sense under close examination. And so when the crusaders said Deus Volt, when they said God wills this, um, we should probably believe that they meant it. Uh, and we should believe that they meant it kind of in opposition to what I have been calling kind of a Protestant polemic, right? which is to say the idea coming from a Protestant ideology that everyone in the Catholic Church is some sort of Machiavellian, um, don't really believe it, uh, trick the people with religion kind of a person. Um, and current historical scholarship will refer mostly to the crusade, at least the first crusade, as an armed pilgrimage. That is, we're all going to Jerusalem, we happen to have spears. I think that gives them a little too much credit on the other side. It's a little overcorrection. But, so what happened? What was the first crusade? Well, the Prince's Crusade, at least, leaves in the summer of 1096. And they take several different overland routes, which you can kind of see on the map behind me. Um, they overwinter in Constantinople, um, where there is obvious friction with the Byzantine Emperor, with Alexos I. Um, because the Byzantine Empire Emperor thinks that they're mercenaries, right? That's what he asked for. Um, and the kind of soldiers coming in don't don't really think they're mercenaries so the byzantine emperor asks for loyalty oaths and withhold food and supplies until they grant him loyalty oaths and so the leaders of the crusade promise to return all former roman territories they conquered to the emperor that is they're mercenaries and in exchange the byzantine emperor empire will provide logistics that is to say food and transport. Um, spoilers, they don't return the territories. In any case, um, the crusaders kind of continue across all of, walk across all of Anatolia, which is no small task, um, and besiege Antioch. Um, they, well, they besiege the town of Edessa first, when they take it, this starts, this forms the county of Edessa. Um, first of the Crusader states, which we'll talk more about in a bit. Um, but then they besiege Antioch in 1097 to 1098. Um, here we start to see a pattern that will repeat. Victory looks incredibly doubtful at Antioch. Antioch is well fortified, is a uh, can withhold, withstand pretty much any kind of army you throw at it. Um, and kind of needed to be compromised by a traitor within, which it was. Um, but in the process of this kind of siege, um, the crusaders discover what they think or what they claim to be the spear of Longinus or the holy lance. This is to say, when Christ is on the cross, one of these soldiers uh, watching him stabs him in the side with a spear. Um, this is usually a mercy blow if you're being crucified. And that spear itself is a relic. This is, um, it's in the Arthurian legends. It's all over the place. It made it into Neon Genesis Evangelion. Uh, it's, the spear of Longinus is very popular. Um, and then they find, after conquering Antioch, the Crusaders finally arrive in Jerusalem in 1099. And again, this is a desperate situation. They don't really seem to have the forces necessary to take the city. Fortified city. Jerusalem's fortifications are not impressive, um, but they still require people. Um, there's, you know, they make a the crusaders make processions barefoot around the city, um, perform acts of penance, uh, take their ships and make them into siege weapons, um, and somehow they manage to capture it. 
And when they capture Jerusalem, they massacre a great portion of the population, rivers of blood flowing through the streets, etc. And this is what has been called a remarkable military success. Um, and as a result, um, by the year 1100, there are crusader states, what we call crusader states, that is say Latin, um, Western ruled states um, across most of what we would now think of as the Holy Land, um, as you can see behind me, from Edessa to Alia, all right? So from, from basically from the Tigris and the Euphrates all the way down to the uh, Arabian Gulf. Uh, they don't always hold these for very long, as you can see by some of the dates. Um, so we, but this also establishes the Kingdom of Jerusalem under uh, Baldwin I. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, but I want to, before we kind of go too much into that and kind of we're running out of this lecture, I just want to kind of stop and pause and think about why the crusade was so successful. Um, absent divine, actual divine intervention, which we will kind of put to the side as a moment, at the moment. The first reason why the First Crusade was so successful is that the Muslims they encountered uh, in, this play, in this world were divided. Um, there is factional infighting between Damascus, um, the Emirate of Damascus, and the Fatimid Caliphate, um, and the Sultanate of Rome. Um, this is to say the three kind of major powers all kind of didn't trust each other and wouldn't help each other. There is also, um, this is kind of new scholarship, but there's also signs that there might have been a plague um, in, the 11, in the 1060s and 10, 1050s and 1060s in the region, which might have resulted in a demographic decline, um, which has had to happen earlier in the West. Whatever the reasons for this kind of unprecedented success, um, the Crusader states kind of quickly become what they would have been in Europe. That is to say, another just group of nobles with territories fighting amongst themselves um, and forming alliances with whoever's around them, Muslim or Christian. Um, and this has led, led to claims that the, the Crusader states, or at least before 1140, were sites of convivencia, which is a Spanish word which means living together or a party. Um, this has been challenged recently with something that uh, what a historian named Christopher McEvitt has called rough tolerance, which is to say um, they didn't want to, they, they tolerated each other without, um, there's a difference between tolerance and toleration, right? Whether or not you're willing to, to sit next to someone doesn't mean you like them. Uh, that's kind of how people want to describe this. Um, and there, ha there was some cross-acculturation. Um, there's not a lot of intellectual cross-acculturation, but this is where Western Europeans learn to build in stone. Stone castles come out of West in Western Europe come out of Western Europeans' experiences in the Holy Land, uh, which is kind of weird. You don't have stone castles in Europe really before 1100. Um, just throwing that out there. And this kind of rough tolerance, um, uneasy peace, um, warring states, whatever you want to call it, is the state of affairs until the 1130s. And what happens next is the next lecture. I'll see you guys then.